This is the Metal Gods Meltdown. What follows is a phone interview with JJ French from Twisted Motherfucking Sister. We are Twisted Fucking Sister is amazing and something you can watch time after time. In fact, I've been hooked. How pleased are you with the reviews from the media? Oh, the reviews have been amazing. Uh, the story is amazing. But I didn't doubt that they were going to be because the story is so unusual. <laughs> so, um, it's not the story of Anvil, that's for sure. I remember watching the tube and Top of the Pops and becoming a SMF right away. In fact, Twisted Sister got me through my troubled and turbulent youth. How does that make you feel when fans say such a thing to you? You know, uh, people say this to me all the time, and I didn't understand it for the longest time, uh, and I mean that with no sense of cynicism, uh, because rock and roll meant everything to me, but I don't think I ever thought if I met my heroes, I'd go, you did this or did this, but you know, maybe I would. So. The bottom line is, is that we're entertainers, and if we've created something musically, atmospherically, socially, that made you feel better about who you were, who you are, and about yourself, then that's about the highest compliment any artist could have. Absolutely, yeah, I agree with you fully. I mean... I remember the first time I got under the blade and I used to play it so loud and I just used to drive my parents demented. In the film it features Kenny, one of the bass guitarists who left Twisted Sister. Do you think he ever regrets leaving? No, I don't think. Kenny had to go. Kenny had to leave to save his life. I don't care taking religion out of it completely and let's talk about people with substance abuse problems. The story of Twisted Sister has tons of those stories in them. You know, we had like 14 ex-members, 11 lineup changes. All, most of those ex-members were fired for substance abuse problems. So think about that for a moment, okay? Um, what's the worst place an alcoholic could ever work? A bar. Uh, yes, absolutely. So, so for Kenny, he needed to live. And working in bars was not the answer. As great as he was a bass player, and he's a great friend of mine. And Kenny left the band voluntarily. He wasn't fired. He was a functioning, a very high functioning alcoholic, of which there are many on this planet, by the way. Yeah. Uh, he's a very high functioning alcoholic. Um, he could do it. I mean, it's amazing that he could. <laughs> the guys who screwed up with the substance abuse problems in the band who became born again Christians who then picketed us because we had a couple of those really kind of blew me away. It was like, really? I fired you because you were a methamphetamine addict uh -huh. or you were doing heroin and we told you to stop doing it and we fire you and you go and you find God and then you picket my band. <laughs> I said, devil, it's such a, hypo it's so hypocritical, so stupid, so stupid
have a twisted sister ever dab dabbled with the devil? Um, it, it, it's almost comical. <laughs> we never ever did anything. Not only from a religious, from a drug standpoint, alcohol standpoint. You know, we were just a business. It was, twisted sister was a band built on a business model, and all the rest of it is just a bunch of peripheral nonsense. Now, do you take all of it and manipulate it? Because it's good for the image? Sure. But does KISS stand for kids in Satan's service? Exactly. Or, you know, did Judas Priest sell their souls to the devil? I mean, come on. It's all just a bunch of nonsense. And to the extent where bands can use it for publicity, it's great. But I have never, not only have I never had a conversation with a single musician, ever, having to do with satanic rituals vis-a-vis -vis rock and roll, I can tell you that in the five years that Twisted Sister was swearing around the world with every major band you can imagine, I was only offered drugs one time backstage by a roadie of a band. Really? Now, I'm not going to tell you that, that's not, that there's not a, drugs around, but what I'm saying to you is it never came into our view at all, ever. Our reputation was when we were straight. No one bothered us, but we were just working guys. And by the way, just about every band that's successful, Kiss, Maiden, Priest, these are hardworking guys. Yeah. Well, they are. They just play rock and roll. They're just hardworking, very talented people whose mission was to become rock stars. They love the idea. And maybe Lemmy, you could say, lived a certain kind of life that in, that kind of um, was emblematic of a certain kind of rock. Uh, maybe let me be thrown in there. But other than that, I never saw any of it. Okay, I saw you um, at Alcatraz Festival in Belgium a few years ago and you're absolutely amazing. Um, you have some big festivals lined up for 2016. Is there anywhere you are especially looking forward to getting out to be playing? Well, I'm excited to do this one more time. And we're doing it this year one last time. And I'm excited for that. Um, you know, it's going to be the end of an era for me. You know, we have 14 years playing the world's biggest rock festivals. So when we say goodbye to Sweden, say goodbye to England, say goodbye to Germany, uh, that part of my life will be over. Yeah. And there's a certain melancholiness about it, uh, but things don't go on forever and ever and ever, and I think it's time that we end before we suck, because frankly, a lot of the bands we play with these days are not good, and, and the fact that they're still playing is their business, but uh, I keep thinking to myself, can't any band here blow us away? And the answer is no, they don't. And I keep thinking, how come? Do they not care? Are they not good? Why does, well, very few bands approach performance the way we do. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, to us, it's an art. And we love entertaining people. And we like putting on the best show we can. That show at Alcatraz you're talking about, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, wasn't Slayer on that bill? No, they weren't, no, no. The, uh, Marilyn Manson, you headlined, was it the Sunday night? And it was just amazing. You blew like all the bands that had been on. It was like within Temptation, Arch Enemy. How was Marilyn Manson? Pretty good. Crap. <laughs> I'm not a fan. Okay. <laughs> just not a fan. So would, would you say that when I make a comment that Twisted Sister is probably the best live act out there, you're going to basically agree with me? Absolutely, yes. No doubt about it. Um, I also, I've not actually seen Twisted Sister that many times, but I saw you supporting Alice Cooper in Newcastle this about five or six years ago, and you blew it, you blew him off the stage, you know, you were just supporting him, it was fun, you were just amazing, and you got the whole room and the whole crap, everyone up, you know, it was brilliant. So yeah, whenever we, I've seen you. We had a lot of fun. Yeah. We had a lot of fun on that tour. Um, you know, because we didn't really tour a lot, so that was one of the few real tours we did. And uh, it was a lot of fun doing that run with Alice Cooper, for sure. And Alice Cooper's remained a good friend to the band. Great guy. This is going to be a bit of a difficult question. How hard has it been with the death of AJ Perry? Did you feel like calling it a day then? And it was a very tough day. It was a, a surreal day. I think I 
cry for four days after that. Um, it was a conversation I had with AJ the night before he died. That was my last conversation with him. I told him, ironically enough, that, uh, that D and I had discussed what we were going to do moving forward, and we decided that last year was going to be the last year. And I told that to AJ on the phone. And I also told him we were going to change our crew around and probably not take an American crew. And his son was on the American crew. So he called or contacted his son after that. Had he not done that, they wouldn't have had a last conversation, which I don't want to get too uh, teary-eyed about it. But in a way, I mean, I said to AJ, look, dude, I think next year, that was last summer, was going to be it. And I said, I'll see you Monday. Come into the office. We have some business to do. He said, fine. And then he said to me, my shoulder's bothering me, and um, I'm going to leave the Adrenaline Mob tour, but because social media is going to report it, just understand I'm just doing it to rehab my shoulder for the summer. Well, obviously, he didn't know he had had a heart attack, and, and he had had a heart attack three days earlier, or two days earlier, so he was performing. He was performing with a heart attack God. for two days, and so anyway... The band got together after the memorial service, and I said, look, guys, next year, 2016, it's the 40th anniversary of me, Eddie, and D, and it should be an anniversary of the core band, and we'll call the tour, you know, it was 40, first it was 40 and farewell, 40 and forget about it, and then it became a 40 and fuck it. Uh, and that's why it is what it is. So I would think with AJ's death, it extended the band's uh, live performance era one more year. You're playing live. Do you feel like he's still there in spirit with you? Well, Mike Portnoy certainly is one of the greatest drummers of all of rock. Uh, undeniably. He's an unbelievable guy. A fabulous drummer. I don't think that there'd be anybody that could replace AJ. AJ had a certain feel. I, I don't care how great any musician is when you change someone who you've been with for 30 years, 40 years, you know how they operate and it's going to be different. Uh -huh. So, um, with Mike Portnoy, it's a little different. Um, he plays differently. Uh, but, you know, we look on stage every time I turn around in my mind, I'm seeing AJ because uh, that's all I saw. Yeah. He's the only drummer. I mean, yes, there was plenty of drummers before him, but he's been there for years, and his drum, you know, he wrote the drum opening for We're Not Gonna Take It. That's one of the most famous drum openings in the history of rock and roll. And he plays it in a very special way, in the same way that Paul Kossoff plays guitar parts on All Right Now that are basic on one level, but yet nobody plays it like Paul Kossoff plays it. And the best guitar players in the world have played it. But Paul Kossoff just had a feel, and AJ has a certain feel. However, Mike Portnoy is A, an unbelievable drummer, and B, he carries through the spirit and the love and the respect to AJ Pearl in a way that AJ would be proud to know. It's the best record. Thanks for sharing that.
It's a shame you never. It's a shame you never did a rap sucks theme, you know. <laughs> well, you know when rap came out, we weren't around, and um, so it kind of never got in our way. Because by the time Twisted Sister came back, the lines were clearly drawn. Don't forget the disco thing back in the day was threatening our livelihood. Yeah. It's uh, being said that D. D. Snyder is very opinionated and says what he thinks and has made him enemies in the past. Is he still the same or has he mellowed a bit with age? Well, he says things and if the band was more reliant on public opinion on certain things, it would matter, but we don't. So when he says things, it doesn't necessarily reflect on whether the band is successful or not successful or whatever. Everyone's entitled to their opinions. I'm entitled to mine. I write a column, a business column for Inc. Magazine. I don't know if you're aware of it. Uh, Inc.com. It's not Inc. as in Tattoo Inc. It's Inc. like Incorporated. Yeah. Inc.com. Right. And you get all the J.J. French articles in which I express my opinion. So I think people are free to express whatever they want. At a certain point in your life, um, you want to say what you want to say. Would it alienate our fans? Uh, you know, it really just depends on what they like. But so far, you know, the PMRC issue, that was a threat against not just us, but the economic structure of certain rock and roll. We were threatened. We had laws written against us to keep us out of certain cities. I don't know if you're aware of that. Yes, I am. I remember it really well. But back in 1986, several cities down in Texas wrote laws called anti-rock ordinances to keep bands like us out, yeah. which are amongst the stupidest laws ever written because it shows you how dumb and ignorant these buffoons were. You know, the law stated that if you performed on stage sex with children, dead people, or animals, or wrote songs about it, you couldn't play there. Well, I have no clue who the hell ever does that. No. The fact that these idiots thought we did was mind-boggling to me. It shows you the satanic ignorance, probably steeped in fundamentalist religious beliefs that are dangerous, uh, something that we fight in America all the time. We, fund, we, we, we kind of fight against religious fundamentalism in all, in, all, in all sides. I mean, Christian, Muslim, you, you know, you name it. I don't like fundamentalists. I don't like people shoving their morality down my throat. Uh, your church... Your temple, your mosque, is a place for you to express it. Uh, don't encroach my life. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Aside from Twisted Sister, what else do you... I do motivational speaking, which I'm um, writing a book. And, um, you know, the, the business of Twisted Sister continues whether we play or not. Because the uh, business of marketing, the brand, the business of marketing music will continue on. We're not going to take it, I want to rock, are inexorably two of my 
mindset that is in the heads of many producers of TV movies. So the songs show up. If you would ask me in 1984 if I thought I want to rock or we're not going to take it would be around 30 years later, I may not have said yes. Um, in fact, I'll go far to say that if you would have asked Priest, ACDC, Kiss, or Iron Maiden, or Black Sabbath, or Scorpions, if their careers would have continued 40 years later, I would think that they would say no. Uh -huh. um, so the fact that we have is extraordinary. What would you personally like Twisted Sister to be remembered for in, say, a hundred years' time? I think that our greatest legacy is being one of the greatest live acts in the history of rock and roll. That as entertainers, we are, we stand alone as one of the few groups that truly understands its audience and understands how to entertain and lift the entire live performance medium up to another level. That's what I'm proudest of. So they... the, fact that we, the fact that we have created a music um, that stands for a certain rebellion and a certain sense of personal validation for making yourself an independent thinker is something I'm also proud of. Mm -hmm. The fact that we have never extolled the virtues of drugs and alcohol is something I'm very proud of. I happen to have a real aversion to... Uh, to substance abuse, and it destroyed many versions of Twisted Sister. It has no place in life. I understand people have problems, and you have to find out how to handle them with the therapy, um, however way you may wish to deal with it. But uh, substance abuse has destroyed uh, everything. Marriages, relationships, business models, your life, people's lives. And so... Uh, I would like to think that people know that we don't champion that. If anything, that we champion a certain level of uh, self-assurance and personal motivation to succeed in life without relying on this kind of stuff. What would you like to say to all the haters and losers who said your band would never make it? Well, all the people who don't like the band? Yeah. Yeah. My girlfriend can't listen to him. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what are you going to say? <laughs> there are people that are always going to be people who don't like it, and that's perfectly fine for me. They haven't stopped the millions of fans from buying our records. Look, we have sold 20 million records. We have performed 9,000 shows in 37 countries. I have 30, 33 or 34 platinum and gold albums around the world. That's a hell of a life. It's a hell of a success story. You can't take it away. And uh, to the people who don't like it, go you know, follow your own path and be successful. So, and when people criticize you, see how well you handle it. Exactly. I like to think we handle it with a certain amount of class. Yeah. Um, but that's how life is. Yeah. Again, like, thank you so much for the music and for the, uh, the years and years of amazing times. Do you have any final words for your fans and our listeners? I do. A lot of young bands ask me all the time for advice. And now that the DVD is out, now that the, you, can, you can stream, we are twisted. Uh, can I say the word? Yes. Uh, okay, now you can stream the movie, We Are Twisted Fucking Sister. It speaks to a tenacity, a tenaciousness, a desire to succeed in the face of all sorts of challenges and crises and catastrophes. Um, I like to think that uh, bands will learn from it. You know, you really have to kind of know your playing field. You have to know where you're going. You have to know what you want. You have to know how to build a community that speaks to you and you speak to them so that you don't have to worry about the rest of the world. You can just forge forward. And you just need to have a never give up mentality. And if you have those things, your chances to succeed are probably greater than people who don't. So I wish all entrepreneurs and fans of life in general to follow those rules and uh, you'll probably be better off for this is this is jj french from twisted sister and you are listening to the metal gods meltdown i wanna rock i wanna rock
Oh boy, is this great!